I'm so grateful you decided to join us today, and let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed by your presence this day, and we thank you for the season of Lent in which you promise to be with us, and we have the opportunity to deepen our relationship with you, and we look forward to the celebration of Easter Sunday, the resurrection of the Lord, that very thing that makes our faith unique, the God who is willing to die and rise again on our behalf. We give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to, seems like a change of pace. We're looking at Psalm 9. Oftentimes we seem to look at a gospel lesson or an epistle lesson. But this actually was one of the lessons to which we made reference this past Sunday. We've been uh, talking about, uh, during the season of Lent, about the emotions, the emotional Christian, the emotions that God has placed in our lives. And in this case, we have been talking about this last Sunday about happiness. Hard to imagine, right? Because we've been talking about all these, what seems to be very negative emotions. Anger and, and fear. These were emotions that would protect us from harm. They were also gifts of God so that you might be safe from those things that intend to harm you. But I also have mentioned multiple times that God has given us emotions that seem to be a little bit better, like happiness and love. We'll be talking about love in a couple of weeks. But happiness, in order to open us up to the blessings that God wants to place in our lives. The problem is we learned on Sunday, we often, when we think about happiness, our happiness is dependent upon the happenstances of life, the circumstances, and they are not always happy. So it seems like there's always some type of pressure some type of sadness on the horizon that puts a pin in the bubble of our happiness just when we seem to arrive at it. So it's like, oh, I'm happy. What's going to happen now? You're ready for the shoe to drop. And so when we talked about Sunday, we need a happiness that is transcendent, not dependent upon the circumstances of life. And what do we call that? We call that joy. We call that peace. We call that whoop, calm. We find that where? In Jesus Christ. So that means no matter the circumstances, we can have this joy, peace, and calm. It doesn't mean we're always bubbly and, and jumping up and down and bouncing off the ceiling, but it does mean that no matter the circumstances, we know that Christ is with us. And so this was one of the Psalms. The Psalm 9 was one of the things that we had made reference to and encouraged you during this season, during this week, as a part of your thought and your prayer about happiness and what God wants to establish in your life, to read Psalm 9. Well, we're going to do that together in case you haven't done it yourself. But let's start with this. Psalm 9. To the leader, according to Mothleben, a Psalm of David, Psalm 9. Now, let me, before I begin, just a, just a little piece of something that's not trivial. They say, say this is a Psalm of David. Now, most people say, oh, it's a Psalm written by David. Well, this, this Hebrew word from which we get of is a very flexible term. It can be by, it can mean of, or can mean pertaining to. It, uh, um, so, uh, by, of, pertaining to, uh, in, in the thought process of, or whatever the case might be. So it doesn't necessarily mean that David the king wrote it. Possibly. It's also just as plausible that one of David's poets or musicians wrote this for David. Or it could be somebody who's writing it thinking about David. We don't know. It could mean all of those things. And so you have to be careful uh, and not just make a, a, a legalistic claim. David wrote this. Well, maybe. We don't know. I mean, it's the same thing uh, when Jesus is talking about the books of Moses. That doesn't mean that Moses wrote it. It just means that Moses is kind of the main character of it and surrounds that story of the Exodus out of Egypt. But it doesn't mean that Moses wrote it, okay? 
it's of or about or by or around the time of or uh, leading to a culmination in Moses, but that doesn't mean that Moses wrote it. And we get so legalistic and bent out of shape about these things. Hebrew doesn't allow us to do this. But nevertheless, this was a psalm written perhaps for the court by somebody, perhaps David or perhaps by one of his poets. It's pertaining to their circumstances. So you are meant to think a little bit about David's circumstances. And you remember David coming to be the king. It was really a process that was fraught with a great deal of tension and he nearly lost his life and of course in the end uh, King Saul was killed and uh, King Saul's son, uh, son Jonathan who was one of David's bestest friends was also killed in the process. It was a very uh, heart, life filled with hardship and then later in David's life uh, was also filled with great hardship. People who were trying to take over the throne and so forth. So you can imagine David's been through a great deal. So this is kind of the backdrop of that. You're meant to, you're meant to realize, yes, great king, multiple trials to get to where he was. Okay, so with that in mind, we can reverse one. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. I will ex be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Okay, so we start with, oh goodness, praise, right? Thanksgiving. Oops, that's supposed to be me. So thanks. This is always a good thing to acknowledge our blessings, you know, uh, that God, what God has done for us. But he goes on and he starts enumerating those things. First of all, about his enemies. Well, these would be happy days. My enemies turned back, they stumbled and perished before you, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. So he's happy that God has brought justice to land. Okay, so that's one of the things he's thankful for. The Lord, but the Lord sits enthroned forever and has established his throne for judgment. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges with people with equity. So again, this really should go down here. The justice of God. It's kind of, you know, uh, Hebrew poetry um, is not the same as our poetry. Not necessarily, uh, well, we don't always have rhyming poetry, but the poetry of the Jews wasn't a rhyming type of poetry. Oftentimes they would have one thought and they would develop the thought in the next phrase. And that's kind of what's happened here. He ends with justice. He begins with justice in the next one. That was a very common style. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. So again, he's reflecting on the same thing. The enemies defeated justice. And now the oppressed, the blessing of the oppressed. Okay? There you go. The blessing of the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So, therefore, so these are the reasons why he's content. He's probably happy. He's content because he's putting his trust in God. And oh, he takes it one step further. So he starts with why he's giving thanks. And now he calls us into it. Look at the next one. Sing praise the Lord who dwell in Zion. Declare his deeds among the peoples. For he who avenges his blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of of the afflicted. Okay, so there seems to be a turn here. So first of all, he begins acknowledging his blessings, how God has in the past defeated him, but it seems like he's setting us up that maybe there's something else going on here. He calls us in our time of need to put our trust in God because he has found God to be faithful, right? His contentment doesn't come from the circumstances of life, but from the faithfulness of God. And so take a look at the next thing. He calls us because he knows that we are now struggling with the similar concerns. The, 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 the uh, life has gotten tough now for us. And so 
he says, hey, look, I want to give you the same advantage that I've had in my life. So look at this. He says, be gracious to me, O Lord. See what I suffer from those who hate me. Do you see the turn? So first of all, the psalmist begins with praise and thanksgiving for what happened in the past. He calls us to depend on the same faithfulness. And now guess what? The circumstances are bad again. Remember when we talked about happiness. This is a problem. Happiness is dependent upon the circumstances of life. The circumstances of life are not always happy. Now, in the past, God delivered him. He was happy, but things are bad again. But this time, he has a foundation. He knows what was done on his behalf in the past. So he knows where to go when things get difficult. Experience. He calls us in the same way to put our trust there. Be gracious. See what I suffer from those who hate me. You are the ones who lift, you are the one who lifts me up from the gate of death, so that I may recount all your praises in the gates of daughter Zion. Rejoice in your deliverance. So he has an expectation. That what God did for him in the past, this faithful God, God will do for him in the present. Yeah, it's a crummy time right now. But I know that God is going to deliver me. You know, it's like that, uh, you know, the uh, one meme I've seen going around, which kind of is true. They said, every worst day of my life, I've made it through. <laughs> Something on that nature. So I will make it through this one. Every worst day of your life, you've made it through. How amazing. You're sitting here and watching this. You have had days of days that you just never thought that you could get through. And you made it through. And what the, uh, uh, the, the psalmist is trying to remind us is that who is the one that brought us through? A faithful God. And so we can trust that God will bring us through this challenging time, whatever it may be. Verse 17, the wicked shall depart to Sheol... All the nations that forget God, the needy, however, shall not be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. You have to remember, God is a God of the poor and the at risk, those who call upon him, not the proud, the rich, and the people who don't think that they need him. And so that should affect everything in our lives, how we treat each other, the politics that we support. I'm not saying that there's a particular one, but anyone, any politics that, that, that encourages the pride, the, the prideful, the arrogant, the haughty, the rich, those are not the politics of the kingdom of heaven. God is the God of the poor and the at risk. God is the God who cares for them and promises to deliver them. David says that is his expectation, the psalmist of this psalm of David. So therefore, he goes on to verse 19, Therefore, rise up, O Lord. Do not let mortals prevail. Let nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let nations know that they are only human. What a great way to end that. So he's calling God to, to, he's calling God to rise up, defend them. Remind people of their, their mortality and that the wealth that they surround themselves with and, uh, is something that's also temporary. One of the things I love about this psalm again is just the shape of it, the form of it, the remembrance again. This is what God has done. The call to us to participate in the very thing that helped him in his time of need, the expectation that God will do it. And again, the visioning, basically on God's behalf. Here it is, God, what we're asking you to do. Rise up on our behalf. Because we have been oppressed and treated unjustly. Um, we've all had circumstances like that in our lives where we feel like we've been treated unjustly, where we've been on the bottom side of things and the world is just the weight of that world is just crushing upon us. And so the psalmist reminds us that even in the midst of these difficult things, 
There is a faithful God sitting on the throne who has not forgotten you. And we've been talking about happiness. Well, the circumstances may not be great. However, you have a God that loves you. And you may not be thrilled right now with the circumstances of your life, but he does promise us that we can have joy and peace amidst the storms of life because we serve a faithful God. If you are struggling today, if your life is filled with hardships, if you don't know how you're going to get through the next 24 hours, let me just pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, faithful God, that you sit on the throne and you care about the poor and those who have been treated unjustly. We pray that you would turn our attention, look, help us to look up, that even though the circumstances of life are not overwhelmingly happy right now for many, help us to have joy in you, a peace in you that comes from knowing that no matter what the circumstances of life, you will bring us through. And even if there is an ending to this life for us, there is still a new beginning with you too. For this we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, blessings to you this week, and may God bless you and keep you, and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.